Okay, we're just going to have uh, folks join. Um, my name is Stephanie Ross. I'm the director of the School of Labor Studies. Uh, welcome here today to uh, the first in our Labor Studies Speaker Series for 2022, uh, which is entitled Interrogating the Union Politics of Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity, uh, a roundtable discussion. Um, we were apologizing a little bit for the delay. We had a little bit of a scheduling conflict, but um, we're just gonna allow people to join. Uh, where it looks like we have lots of attendees, so excited to have you all here. Um, and to engage with us in this conversation with a, a panel of leading uh, uh, activists uh, and uh, you, in the labor movement, people who I've, I've felt privileged to know for many years, um, and I'm sure most of you in the audience also know and uh, have been inspired by. Um, and so uh, let me just, uh, before I turn to introducing the panel, let you know that this is the first of three uh, sessions in our speaker series this semester. Uh, there's a, a two more coming up in March, one on March 3rd, which is about environmental racism, environmental justice and work after COP26, which will feature amongst other folks, uh, Chris Wilson from uh, the Public Service Alliance of Canada and other others from the um, coalition of black trade unionists uh, who were in attendance at COP26. Um, and then on March 16th, we're going to have Dr. Rob Gillizo, who is in the Department of Economics at University of Victoria, talk about his research on collective bargaining, police unions, race and civilian deaths, in which he explores the question of whether or not the advent of collective bargaining rights for police has led to higher incidents of civilian deaths uh, in the United States. Um, I, I won't give you any spoilers. Uh, it is a very interesting and important paper, I think, for labor movement folks uh, to hear about. So if you're interested in um, engaging more with the activities that we have going on at the School of Labor Studies, please uh, check out our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash MacLabor, M-A-C-L-A-B-O-U-R. We announce all of our events there. Uh, if you follow us, you can uh, get notice of all of the upcoming events. Okay, so without further ado, and uh, now to turn to this, the subject matter of the day. Um, as all of you here know, the past two years have been a watershed in anti-racist struggles. Um, and that has led many organizations, uh, including the labor movement, but not only, to interrogate their commitments to and progress towards racial equity. And I, while the labor movement has been a site of significant anti-racist struggle and activism throughout its history, like all of our institutions, it also works under the burden of a long legacy of both overt and systemic racism. And this burden presents those of us who believe in the liberatory power of labor movements with a real challenge to critically examine the extent to which that legacy has been seriously addressed and overcome. Uh, to what extent have labor organizations delivered on the promises made in many policy papers to challenge systemic racism in its representational structures, its organizational practices, and its cultures of solidarity? What are the continuing barriers to genuine progress on this front? what actions are needed now, and who is responsible for taking those actions. Um, and this, these are the questions that we motivated us to gather together this panel of leading labor movement activists to assess these enduring barriers to equity, diversity, and inclusion in unions, uh, and to discuss the actions that will actually deliver racial equity for workers in their own organizations. Um, and I will just say that the that this roundtable was particularly inspired by a chapter that was co-authored by two of our speakers today, Winnie Ng and Carol Wall, called, unsurprisingly, Interrogating the Union Politics <laughs> of Equity, Inclusion, and Diversity. And that chapter appears in the new edition of Rethinking the Politics of Labor in Canada, uh, which I had the honor of co-editing. Um, and in it, 
Winnie and Carol review the long history of both racism and anti-racism in the labor movement, and they provide a bracing critique of the limits of the movement's responses to those problems to date. Um, while they remain convinced that the labor movement is, quote, a natural fit, for racialized and indigenous workers who seek equality, racial justice, and a just society for all. They also argue that the work to accomplish that is not only incomplete, but must be taken up with renewed urgency and without the burden for change falling solely on the shoulders of racialized and indigenous members themselves. So they call in particular for white activists to become what they call co-conspirators. And I hope they will talk more about that idea today uh, to critically examine the, the space that as white people they occupy in movements and to renew the support, their support for racialized activists and their work. Um, so uh, let me just quickly introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, and we'll turn it over to them. You've heard me talk enough. Um, so uh, first, uh, Carol Wall, who will, who will begin, um, who has a long and varied history of activism, leadership, and education work in the labor movement. Uh, she was at the Toronto Star for 17 years uh, as a, a national account executive and was very active in her union local, the Southern Ontario Newspaper uh, Guild. Uh, which was a part of the, uh, the Communication, Energy and Paper Workers Union, uh, which led her to become the first human rights director with CEP. Um, and uh, she previously held many positions in that organization from national rep, uh, negotiating collective agreements, doing arbitrations, et cetera. Um, Carol represented the CEP uh, at the Canadian Labour Congress delegation to World Conference Against Racism. She later became a negotiator with the Public Service Alliance of Canada uh, as, and was the Ontario Regional Director of the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service. Um, and I would say too, also is the co-author of a very well-known and respected book, Education for Changing Unions, um, which uh, was published and won the best book uh, in that year in 2002 uh, in labor education. Um, I could go on, but we only have 30, you know, a few more minutes. So uh, Carol uh, will uh, lead off the discussion and then she'll be followed by Winnie Ng, uh, who has been for the last four decades, really a champion for the rights of workers through her involvement in a wide variety of labor organizations and networks. And I would say has inspired generations of labor activists to follow in her footsteps. Um, Winnie has been the acting executive director of the Labor Education Center in Toronto. She was the Canadian Labor Congress's Ontario Regional Director, the Labor Co-Chair of Good Jobs for All Coalition in Toronto, an executive member of the Asian Canadian Labor Alliance. Um, she uh, also has um, a, a doctorate from OISE and was the Unifor National Chair in Social Justice and democracy at what we are now calling X University until they find a better name that reflects uh, the, the values of that university. Um, she continues to be a, a sought after speaker and contributor on the issues that we are talking about today, including many and many more. Uh, so once Carol and Winnie uh, talk about their uh, chapter, uh, we'll hear responses from two folks, uh, Fred Hahn, who is the president of CUPE Ontario. Uh, Fred is a social worker uh, and who became active in CUPE beginning in 1991 uh, on the staff of Community Living Toronto. Uh, that is actually where I met and got to know Fred uh, when he was the president of CUPE Local 2191, uh, which he led in a successful three month strike uh, in the in the, in the middle of the Harris years, a very difficult mm -hmm. time to engage in any kind of um, collective bargaining struggle, but it was a, a, a very inspiring uh, struggle. Uh, Fred joined the CUPE Ontario Executive Board in 1998 and has served on numerous provincial and national CUPE committees, including the National Pink Triangle Committee. Um, he was elected Secretary Treasurer of CUPE Ontario in 2006. And then in 2010 became 
uh, the president of CUPE Ontario, the first LGBTQ person elected to lead the province's largest union. Um, so welcome, Fred, and um, I'm really looking forward to hearing your uh, interventions here. And then last but certainly not least uh, is Patricia Chong. Uh, who is no stranger to the School of Labor Studies. She holds an MA from Labor Studies uh, from our program. She also has a master's in labor Poli policies and globalization from the Global Labor University in Germany. Uh, while she was at Mac Labor Studies, she wrote a very important and widely read thesis called Sex, Race and Sacrifice uh, that talked about the contradictory experiences of young female racialized organizers in the labor movement who even as they were being included, uh, were also burdened with some of the most difficult work and, and were not adequately supported by those very structures that wanted them in their ranks. Uh, she is a documentary filmmaker, a member of the Asian Canadian Labor Alliance. She volunteers with the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists on their environmental racism project, and she is currently an education officer for Amaxio. So, Without further ado, let us turn it over to Winnie and Carol. Uh, Carol, to start, they'll talk for about 20 minutes or so. Uh, and then Fred and Patricia will each have about 10 minutes to respond. We'll open up to questions from the floor after that, which I'll ask you to type into the Q&A box and I'll, I'll do the work of posing those questions to the panelists. So I'll turn it over to you, Carol. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, it's great. I wish we were we could be in person, but this is the the alternative that we're using now. So I, I just want to start with um, acknowledging the territory that I'm speaking to you from, because I'm actually on the territory of the Anishbek, Mississauga, adjacent to the Haudenosaunee territory, and in the territory covered by Williams Treaty. So I think it's important for me to start that way. And um, in, in full Winnie and Carol fashion, uh, we decided that we wanted to dedicate this session um, to Martin Luther King and Bell Hooks. Um, Martin Luther King Day being yesterday, although it should be celebrated all the time, and, and of course the passing of Bell Hooks um, for their, not only for their inspiration, but for their visions of what we see as freedom and love. And, and as well as their guidance on how to create the beloved community, which speaks not only to struggle and resistance, but to revolutionary love. So we wanted to start and dedicate this session to that. And when we talk about revolutionary love, um, that is central to our critique when we think of the labor movement, um, because it, and, which is evident in our chapter um, and, and any discussions we have about the labor movement. And Stephanie, you sort of you know, said it at the beginning, one of the things in our chapter we say, despite its fault, the labor movement is a natural fit for us. That's, that's where we, we will, um, until my dying breath, that's where we will continue to do the work um, and, and make sure that um, we, we, we end up in the vision that we have for the movement, the movement and the potential of the movement. Because for, for, for me, that's the raison d'etre of the labor movement. It's not only the uplift of working people, but it's the dismantling of the interlocking oppressions that both Martin and Bell Hooks talked about so eloquently. Martin spoke of three major evils. He talked about the evil of racism, the evil of poverty, and the evil of war. Bell coined the phrase and named it long before, as much as I love um, Kimberly Crenshaw, the intersectionality because she always spoke about imperialism, patriarchy, capitalism, and white supremacy. So that is, that is the sense of our, of our chapter, of our discussion. And because we applaud and we criticize because we know the potential of the labor movement to be that beacon of light, to be that um, beacon of light that liberates all of us all of us from uh, the, you know, all that is killing us, the racial injustice, the ecological devastation. I'm glad to hear that you're doing one on environmental racism, poverty and greed, 
this is all of the things that is actually killing us that we need to start talking about because now it's I mean, one of the things that we, we, why we purposely named the equity, diversity, inclusion, um, and again, not that this, this is important work, but it, it seems that it's given us a bit of a cover for doing the really, having the real hard discussions about the roots of all of this and what is the responsibility of white people to a system that was designed and built for them and them only. And that's, and that's the hard discussions to start having, right? Um, and so, because the labor movement along with, with social justice partners, for me, that, this is our last hope. This is, this is our, our real hope of doing the long haul work and them being in the lead to do this long haul work of dismantling these oppressions that if, if the pandemic and all that has gone on has not shown us anything, it should, it, it should, it, it, it has cracked open wide the inequality that exists, not only in Canada, but globally. And we only fix this by having those conversations that really looks at capitalism, white supremacy, patriarchy, imperialism. That's the conversation that we have to have because it, it comes down to that incredible, wonderful phrase that if not now, when? And if not us, who? Right? I mean, this is, this is, is what we are called to do as trade unionists of, of, of the people who believe that everyone deserves to be liberated. So today, what I'd really like, um, more so than us talking, is to really get into, I want to hear, I absolutely want to hear from Fred and, and Patricia. I mean, again, these are comrades that I've worked with over the years and, and had incredible conversations. And, and, and Winnie and I, I mean, we're, you know, sisters of, a, a, we, we've been in this struggle forever and we'll, we'll be until they put us into the ground. But so I want to have a real authentic conversation. And I, and I think it's important as I try to, I say I'm always in a state of learning and unlearning, learning and unlearning. And the unlearning is harder than the learning, I must tell you, because we breathe this thing, in, this stuff in all the time, right? And so I, I've really been working on decolonizing my mind and, and, and my, my, my view of things and, and sort of stepping back. And, um, and so in that spirit of having an authentic conversation, I'd like us to have the guidance of the gifts from Indigenous teachers that centers the seven grandfathers teachings of humility, bravery, honesty, wisdom, truth, respect, and love. That is the only way, if we don't center those things, that we can have this conversation in a way that um, respects the differences, hears the differences, challenges the differences, but we are what I call staying in the room until we get this done. Because again, if not us, who? So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my sister, Winnie. Who's muted? Yeah, Un unmute yourself, Winnie. Unmute yourself. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Carol. Uh, thank you for reminding us why we're here. And I think just continuing paying homage to Bell Hooks, I want to start off my, my piece with a quote from her. She said, when you have love, you have the community of belonging that comes with it. And in a way, the sense of belonging, the sense of being home has always been what we've been striving for within the labor movement, right? That's that famous slogan, when you call me a brother or a sister, do you really mean it, right? And how does that labor family come together to become a fist? I want to start off by 
by sharing a bit of, in a way, what Carol has said, it's the unlearning and unlearning, more from a very personal level. I began at the labor with the labor movement in Toronto as a union organizer with the International Ladies Garment Workers Union back in 1977. And seeing, recognizing all the immigrant women workers who barely spoke English and it was so heavily exploited, I thought, ah, maybe then I got involved with the English in the Workplace program. Naively thinking that if the, of the, these immigrant workers have the English proficiency, they, can, they could have a more meaningful engagement and participation within the union. Without, and that was <laughs> in my <laughs> younger days, without recognizing there's a whole systemic barriers of racism, of uh, sexism, and class that are uh, intersecting and blocking every way, you know, the movement in uh, their participations in every way. And here I want to share, you know, at the inaugural, at the founding gathering of the Asian Canadian Labour Alliance, I met uh, a brother, an Asian Canadian brother who is a postal worker and he's in his 50s and he just became a shop steward. So we were celebrating. And then he said something really quite poignant and profound. He said, had I been white and a native speaker, I would have been a shop steward 20 years earlier. And to me, I think this is where the essence, that's what the rage that keeps <laughs> the fire in my belly. It's why are we keep missing and missing a whole generations of activists that should be rightly involved. And so to me, you know, it's, it has always for in, in reviewing the history of equity and anti-racism initiatives in the labor movement, it has always been black, indigenous and racialized workers that have forged and pushed and tried to elbow a bit of space within the movement from the sleeping car porters in 1917 to the Chinese shingle workers of Canada in 1919. These, the early days to now the early, you know, the contemporary, you know, so it's a shout out also to coalition of black trade unionists, Asian Canadian Labour Alliance, Latude when it was around, uh, Workers Action Center and Justicio that have been for trying to forge a progressive working class movement. So in that sense, all these EDI, IDE initiatives is not been, has not been at the good grace and the awakening of the white knights or as Cedric Robinson would refer as the labor aristocrats, right? It has, you know, like the employers and the governments, these labor leaders also recognize it's a strategic move to include the others, quote unquote, as a way to protect their own interests, benefits, and positions. And so, so it's in that sense, I'm, you know, um, that they need to be seen as doing, they are, sometimes they're either guilt to do it, they're pushed to do it, or they'll be seen as taking the politically correct <laughs> uh, actions uh, before their leadership get challenged. Uh, you know, I, and I can still remember about 12 years ago when I raised the, the importance of linking indigenous issue, indigenous self-determinations within the labor movement. I was told that the percentage of indigenous members is so, was so minuscule that it's not a priority and how things change in a decade with the activism and the pushing and the advocacy of I don't know more movement and all the commissions that come, of, come forth. So, so for the love of the movement, <laughs> both Carol and I are saying, it's our assertion that, that EDI, equity, diversity and inclusions or IDE, if we continue on this same platitude, same treadmill, where leaders can participate in the comfort of their privilege and positions and that they can be seen as the champions 
of anti-racism while maintaining without any touch, any losing of their power and privilege, then this movement eventually will die. That will be D-I-E, right? So, and to us, it's inclusion and inclusiveness without healing the wound, without confronting the systemic barriers and without holding each other accountable becomes meaningless. And it's just window dressing. To, to be, you know, to be quite frank. And here, I, I guess I want to just draw on quickly, sort of um, back to the theoretical framework of racial capitalism that has been put forward by Cedric Robinson and Kelly, Robin Kelly in our, in our chapter, I, you, we used a quote by him saying, you know, um, and I'll just read it because I think it's important to say, Race is not primarily an identity, but a structure of power or a means of structuring power through difference. Not only does it provide, pr produce deep race, class, gender inequalities, but it continues to keep a segment of the white working class in a state of precarity while convincing, that black, convincing them that black and brown people are to blame. And to me, I think this is where the share common enemy, the share ideology comes in. If we think of uh, John Powell had, had used a great analogy saying, imagine neoliberalism as a car, then the anxiety and fear about others is the fuel that drives the car at its full speed. And now, you know, as a part of the right-wing populist uh, era right now, it's that car is speeding down fast, right? And so I, I think it's, it's in that political context, I mean, uh, of what bell hooks have said, has used in the political context of the imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, heteros, hetero patriarchy. How can we hold each other accountable? How can we seize this moment of reckoning with the Black Lives Matter movement, the indigenous movement, um, to expose and seize this movement to do something much deeper and much more meaningful? What's that sense of belonging that is grounded on revolutionary love that we need to talk about? And how do we, both as Black, Indigenous, racialized trade union brothers and sisters, work with right, white brothers and sisters as co-conspirators. We are saying uh, the word allies does not go far enough. Allies can be polite, allies can be supportive, but allies, but cons co conspirators, it's recognizing we are like this and we need to be intertwined in tackling and dismantling this <laughs> capitalist, patriarchist, uh, white supremacist and heterosexual patriarchy. How do we do this in a way that is authentic as Carol has said, and at the same time, lifting everybody up, right? I, I guess I'm, I just want to say finally, it's, as, as a person of color, I'm tired of being always being pigeonholed into the spot that where human rights and anti-racism it's it's in discussions. Where are the white folks that need to step up and start reflecting? I mean, all of us through inter internalized racism, we are complicit and we need to take our responsibility. And how do we do it in a way that's genuine and not for spectacles? So that's that's my intervention for now. And Carol, you want to keep pushing for some more? <laughs> uh, thank you, Winnie. Um, and, and so important with the co-conspirators, and and I can I can say in my so-called retirement, um, I am mainly working with an Indigenous woman and a Francophone woman 
who understand what co-conspirators mean. We have some really tough discussions and, and, and really authentic discussions and do the reflection to, to, to step in when, as Winnie said, I'm tired. So now I'm, I need you. I need you to, to, to keep the charge because, you know, there's been discussion over the years and you, because of exhaustion and just, and you start to think, well, maybe we'll just do our own thing. Maybe we'll just, you know, we'll just start our own trade unions and we'll just do our own thing. But, but that's not the ideal because, you know, I've said to people, we live in, we live in two different Two different countries and I don't want to live in two different countries I, I, I don't want that I, I, I don't want to, to live in a world that is was designed and built only for white people and I'm and we're always the other and how can we fit them in that's not the world I want so I think this is the time for us to really have these discussions to, to, to reimagine and say, no, no, we want a world, we want one world of, of justice and equity. We want one world. And that means that we're all included right from the very be beginning because that's what we struggle with. We weren't part, this, this is working. Racial capitalism is working exactly the way it was designed. There's, there's no, you know, there's no mystery here. There's no, no, it's working. It's, keep us divided. Keep us, you know, uh, you know, scrambling over the crumbs and doing the internalized racism. I mean, part of my, in my other years, what I hope to do is work within my community to heal the collective trauma and wounds that racism and patriarchy and imperialism have caused because they're deep and they're real and they keep us apart. And that's not who we were meant to be. And so I'd like to do that work now, which means I now rely on my right white activists to start doing the other work so then we can come together and do this work because we can only do it together. None of us can do this work separately, but it means that we need to understand and ask that question of who benefits from certain things and who doesn't, and are we willing to make that change? Are we willing to finally say, we're gonna stop, we know we've been advantaged and we're gonna step back from that and we're really gonna roll up our sleeves and do this work together. That's, that's the real question here. And that goes beyond EDI. That goes beyond all the, visions and distractions and diversions that are, are possible in that because we don't want to talk about the two legacies, the legacies of colonialism, well, more than two, the legacies of colonialism, the legacies of the transatlantic slave trade, the legacies of patriarchy, the legacies of imperialism. That's what we're wrestling with. I think we should stop because I really do want to have a conversation. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thanks, uh, Carol and Winnie, for um, starting us off. So let's now turn to Fred to uh, hear some of his thoughts, um, probably as a co-conspirator, but we'll see if that term resonates with you um, and what what you uh, what you think about the challenge that uh, Carol and Winnie have posed to us. Thank you so much and, and for the invitation. And it, it's such an honor and pleasure to be here and to see folks who I uh, look up to and learn from and am a, and try my best to be a co-conspirator with uh, folks like Carol and Winnie. Uh, and of course, Stephanie talked a bit about our history uh, back at QP and, uh, and it's great to be here with Patricia. There's, uh, I, I wanna start by saying that I am coming uh, uh, joining uh, from the territory uh, uh, known as Toronto or Takaranto. It is the traditional territory of the Huron Wendat, the Anishinaabek, the, uh, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And it is part of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Covenant, uh, a covenant between uh, a series of uh, 
those in the Iroquois Confederacy to share and care peaceably for the for the land around the Great Lakes. And you know, it, it's an important framing because um, the way in which uh, people share and care for uh, the land, but also our future, is I think part of this discussion. Um, at least uh, in listening to uh, the opening and reading the chapter, it's what I've been thinking a great deal about. I I've been thinking about uh, my experience in our union and the role that I currently uh, occupy there um, and about some of the elements uh, that were raised in uh, today, but also in, in the chapter. Uh, there's uh, long, I think, for some of us been a discussion uh, about the, one of the principal ways that uh, have, have been utilized in the labor movement uh, to try to deal with uh, all these white straight men in leadership has been to create positions in leadership bodies. And there's a tension between feeling as though those can be tokenistic and whether or not they matter. Um, uh, alongside that, I think, is the challenge that comes from the policy papers and the kind of, um, you know, the good words uh, on paper and then the question about follow up and action and, and the matter, important matter of, uh, of self-organizing and the real work uh, done particularly by Black and racialized and Indigenous members in our union. And I was thinking about all three of those things because in thinking about my experience of the way in which our union continues to evolve, by that I mean the Ontario part of QP, the, um, the, I think all three of these things have had uh, a role. Uh, we went through a series of things over a number of years to change our elected leadership structures and our constitution. That was not without a lot of debate and discussion and fight and failure, quite honestly. And it wasn't until we involved our entire leadership body in a restructuring of our leadership process that included um, ensuring that all of the constituency voices were around the table. It wasn't until in that process, we helped people to, and we, we consciously um, equated. In CUPE, we have sectors of workers. We have municipal workers and healthcare workers and school board workers and university workers. Uh, I'm forgetting a sector. They're gonna be disappointed with me when, I, uh, when they hear this. Um, our sectors matter a great deal. And what we, what we reminded all of us about was that these are constituencies of our members and that we have other constituencies of members. We have women and we have black and racialized workers and we have indigenous workers and LGBTQ workers and young workers and workers with disabilities. And that all of these constituencies, when they have voice and active activity in the union that strengthens us. And when our leadership, all of our current sitting executive board members agreed to that. And then when we went and did regional meetings with local leaders and area councils and talked to people about the rationale behind the structural change and why it would strengthen, how it would strengthen the union. That was how we became successful in, in an actual structural change. But the seats were only the one piece. We then had to think about resourcing those roles, ensuring that, that people actually had uh, were active in other components of the union. So the finances of the union, uh, the labor relations pieces, because we hire staff in QP Ontario. Uh, so that it wasn't a, a, a you know, a, you are just there as an equality person. You're only gonna talk about that. It was like, how do we ensure that you are now part of a leadership team? And so you are now gonna have additional responsibilities like other people on the leadership team. And as we were going through that process, uh, uh, during one of our last uh, uh, couple of in-person conventions ago, it was a convention in 2019, uh, Black members uh, created space on our convention floor and finally spoke truth to delegates at that convention, including me as the chair at the time of that convention and as our president about their experiences in our union. They were uh, these were challenging stories, more challenging 
for people to live than for others to hear, but they were incredibly important. It was an incredibly important moment. It was completely out of order. Uh, by the way, the rules of order are another whole thing we could talk about uh, some other time. But as the chair, it was important. I knew how important it was for this uh, time to be spent uh, and for our members to hear from one another about the reality uh, that people experienced. And from that came a motion from the floor of our convention to, for us mandating us to, to create an anti-racism organizational action plan. Uh, and we were like, geez, that sounds good. What the heck is that? Uh, and so we, we went off to try to craft and think about what that would mean. We worked, of course, with our equality leadership, but also other leaders in the union. We worked with our national union and we sought outside expert advice, including Carol uh, as one example, to come and help us to think through uh, all the different ways in which um, we were gonna need to take on these questions. Um, because, you know, uh, we're dealing here with white supremacy a deeply rooted element of our society that includes our organizations and unions. Um, it is dogged and deeply rooted. And so it can't ever be a one and done thing. It can't just be a passing of a policy paper. It must be an ongoing discussion, an ongoing way in which we are all learning and unlearning. Um, I know, uh, uh, I feel, um, so strongly about the, the process that we're a part of, because I feel as though in some ways I can begin to see the benefits of the, the, the you know, in, the, in my bio, you heard, I've been around for a while. Uh, and so I remember uh, what our union was like uh, when I first became active and, and I see difference now. Um, as an openly gay person, I was one of the only openly gay people that ever I saw at our, in our leadership at different local levels, in our structures. We now have uh, uh, the space of, of, of me and others being there and pushing to open that space has meant that there are now other uh, LGBTQ leaders throughout our union in different structures and at the local level and as local leaders and as sectoral leaders, as a matter of fact, in a way in which that would never have happened when I first joined QP. The same thing is starting to happen around Black and racialized workers. Our last convention, we elected a leadership team um, and we often, you know, we, we talked proudly about the way in which we uh, had changed the structure of our union some years ago to add equality representation but you know, we have black and racialized members who are vice presidents. We have black and racialized members uh, who represent, uh, who are general board members. Uh, these are not, the, there's a cultural change that has begun more in earnest. Uh, it is, I would argue, what, I'm, what keeps me up at night <laughs> is that I'm quite worried about, uh, about the impacts of the pandemic in relation to some of the work that we've been able to achieve and been able to take on. Um, I know my time's coming, so I'll quickly say that um, during the discussions about vaccination policies and protocols in the public sector, uh, these were difficult conversations in our membership, partly in, in no small part because a relatively small but vocal group of our members uh, had gone down rabbit holes and, uh, and been, been poisoned by misinformation. And uh, they were being instructed to send me and other labor leaders uh, notarized things from lawyers. A anyway, all of this to say, when we started to look at where were they getting this advice, uh, we discovered that it was from organizations, all of which are white supremacy organizations that turned their attention almost exclusively to providing misinf and disinformation around vaccination to, uh, to working people as a way to recruit. In fact, we reported a number of them to the Canadian Anti-Hate Network and, we, and they shared with us that in fact, uh, virtually every white supremacist group in, that operates uh, 
from coast to coast, you know, here had turned its sights in this way. And there's been an infiltration uh, in terms of working people in relation to these groups that is focused on this particular issue today, but we know uh, uh, that won't go away. So this work is, uh, we have, a, there's an exciting opportunity that's been presented by the horrible, uh, from all good things, from all bad things can come good. The horrors uh, that we saw in the pandemic, the way in which it clearly demonstrated uh, the black and racialized folks, women, uh, those who have been uh, struggling to gain actual equality were those who were hardest hit. Well, we see that, people saw that, but the right and white supremacist organizations are on the rise as well. All challenging things that mean that we have to keep going. And as a leader, I have to be willing to say, that white supremacy is real, that it is part of our organizations, that it hurts our capacity to represent workers, that we will not be successful. We cannot be successful in, uh, in achieving economic justice for workers without racial justice. There is no economic justice without racial justice. Sorry, I went over time, thank you. That's all right. I'll be very indulgent, but the, that was a wonderful uh, note to end on, Fred. Thank you so much for your comments. Let's turn it over to Patricia, who has a PowerPoint for us. Uh, so she will dazzle us with her visual images. I always have visuals when I go. Uh, okay, so th uh, thanks very much for having me. Uh, I'm uh, coming to you from uh, Vaughan, just north of Toronto. Uh, that is Haudenosaunee and Huron Wendat territory. Uh, so uh, as you know, uh, so I read Carol and Winnie Ng's uh, chapter. Uh, before I go into my response, I think uh, I just wanna thank uh, everyone for organizing this in the talk. And I thank Carol uh, uh, opening it in terms of love and positivity and Fred also talking about the challenges and bringing the good because uh, obviously the pandemic has been a really hard time uh, and I'm fighting my inclination to just, you know, hate everyone and, and just uh, hibernate and just say F everyone and F this and I don't care anymore. Uh, so it's nice to have that uh, reassurance to not go to the dark side. So just wanted to share that before I start my presentation. It's always a, a battle with me. Okay, so I think, tell me if you, am I wrong? Do you see a PowerPoint? Yes, okay. So um, I don't know why Dick, oh, there we go. So I pulled this one, I think, a key paragraph from Carol, Ng, sorry, Carol Wall and Winnie Ng's uh, chapter. Um, and, uh, and I kind of want to use this as a jumping point. So th this is from their chapter. Who benefits when racialized union members are dismissed or treated as equity props? It is our assertion that after decades of union task forces and resolutions, anti-racism workshops, inspiring speeches, symbolic statements, equity seats, and equity-based conferences and caucuses, the labor movement needs to sharpen its focus and be clear about naming and addressing, and addressing white supremacy. If the labor movement continues to talk in these broad equity, diversity, and inclusion terms, it will continue to tiptoe around white supremacy. Part of naming white supremacy is to acknowledge the existence of racial capitalism. Uh, and I think that really captures, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the key points of uh, today's um, conversation. So just to go to the next slide. So my main points, uh, I'm only going to really talk about the first two, is that personally, uh, I think that we are trapped within a union framework that still largely fails to challenge capitalism, never mind challenging what uh, Carol and Winnie refer to as racial capitalism in the chapter or white supremacy. So I think we're kind of trapped in the framework and we talked, people talked a little bit about learning and unlearning. And I personally still find that people glorify the post-World War II period as this great time for unions when we have to realize that the majority of the working class were denied those very rights by trade unionists. So this kind of idealization of the past is, is still very problematic. And I think it fails to recognize how labor has systemically and historically marginalized uh, indigenous and racialized peoples. 
And secondly, I kind of wanted to talk about what exactly is the goal? You know, we say we, we want to broaden the labor movement. We want to, you know, some people talk about having racialized and indigenous people in the positions of leadership. Are we talking about overthrowing racial capitalism? Are we talking about equal representation? Like what exactly is your goal? I feel that we're almost so far from having equality, never mind equity. We are all going towards this goal, but our goals are actually quite different. And uh, I don't think sometimes we never really get to talk about it. And then lastly, uh, as was mentioned, I'm a member of the Asian Canadian Labor Alliance uh, and Winnie Ng was key in starting that. And it's uh, kind of based off of the coalition of black trade unionists. So I did wanna, I don't wanna leave on a depressing note, but there are some things that, you know, ACLA has been doing, small steps, it's a community. It helps me a lot in terms of my own frustrations within the labor movement uh, and my own work, paid and unpaid work as well. So those are my two things. So, and I have this cycle because I feel like we're always here. So I think again, and this is my opinion, my opinion alone, not my not employers or not ACLA. So I feel like, again, we're trapped within a union framework that was largely uh, fail to challenge capitalism. So we're talking about this, never mind talking about racial capitalism. And so really briefly, and I'm not going to go into a lot, and I do have uh, resources that people can read at the end, but the idea that uh, of a labor hierarchy that's based on a strict cisgender, heterosexual, and racialized division of labor that is heavily linked to citizenship and therefore the nation state. And the Cano Glenn has written extensively on this, albeit from a uh, United States of America perspective in her book, Unequal Freedoms, which is a great book. And this idea of this uh, hierarchy, we have always had as like the top of the labor hierarchy, the standard employment relationship, full time, you work for one employer until you die, you know, all the time, get benefits, blah, blah, blah. The standard employment relationship was for white working class men. It's not the norm for the working class in general, nor was it ever intended to be the norm. And then I quote Bosco, and I, like, I love this quote. So what has emerged from this history is a profound identity between the interests of white working class men and the meaning of trade unionism. So that now it is seemingly impossible to disengage the ways in which trade unions act to protect the narrow economic interests of a particular group of men and industrial relations concept conceptualization of trade unionism as a social force. Uh, and then there's Anne Forrest. So again, it's so important to ground ourselves in this history. And I, I would argue unlearning about labor history. And I included Groundhog Day because I have not been around as, as long as others, but I feel like haven't I had this conversation so many times? So again, I, I don't know how like Carol and Winnie and Fred stay optimistic. Uh, I'm sure you all have your bad days, but you know, to me, you know, I haven't been around that long and I'm just like, haven't I had this conversation a million times? So there was frustration, I'm joking about it, but you know, there's frustration, there's anger, you know, there's pain. Again, there's the whole, I don't wanna to talk to anyone for the rest of my life, I wanna to move to an island and not have to deal with this. So just wanna put it out there. So uh, quickly again, talking about how sometimes, at least I've been taught about labor history, Canada passes the wartime labor relations regulations in 1944. And we're all like, yay, that's great because it sets the labor principles of industrialization. So how a union's able to be uh, certified, the ability to file an unlabor, unfair labor practice. And later we get the famous RAND formula, you know, as you know, as Canadians. So this period, people love it. And they're like, it's the golden age. It's the social pact, it's the labor management accord and labor peace, because in the economy, at least in the, I'll talk about Canada, the real wage was increasing because wages were linked to productivity, which was still going up. So at that stage, at the, at the post World War II boom, people are big baby boom, everything's going up. And so the question that Bill Fletcher, you know, talks about and others is why should it, why should unions have confronted capitalism in, era, in an era of plenty and relative peace? So when unions are quite strong, and we often talk about union density, union density, we need to get back to union density, which of course is important, but what was happening at that time? And so uh, I will go out, oops, go down to my next quote. Um, so this kind of compromise and how this compromise may have 
set a foundation that is very difficult for us to escape from. Not impossible, but difficult. So industrial unions were legally recognized as legitimate collective bargaining agents on the condition that they acknowledge in practice the basic norms on which liberal social relations are constructed. Most importantly, that they uphold the sanctity of the contract, the union contract, into which they enter and assume the corresponding responsibility for controlling their membership. So again, the idea is that yes, you know, we are able to make gains because it's in a it's in an era of relative uh, prosperity. But the compromise here is that unions are acting as kind of uh, are, are acting as channels for conflict by taking, you know, the right, no, by taking, in a sense, the ability for workers to go on strike when they want to, a wild cat, and then saying, actually, no, you can't do that. You need to go through this grievance, then the arbitration, yada, yada, and collective bargaining. Uh, and I'm not saying that that's bad. Obviously, I think grievances, grievance procedures are important. Collective bargaining is important. Having a contract is important. I worked as a union organizer, so I strongly believe in this. But also we need to recognize the bigger structure, which is really about that the whole foundation of the Canadian labor relations is conflict resolution. So what role do we as a volunteer shop stewards, as staff, as leaders, how do we escape that? And, and can we essentially? And then uh, briefly, uh, I think everyone's seen pictures with this Jenga stuff belonging, inclusion, diversity, equity. What exactly is the goal? And I think, and again, I think it's important we do have this, as I think it was uh, Carol who said it's kind of like a cover to go in there and start having the conversation. But of course, a critique of EDI is that it reorganizes people and not power. So it never gets to the point where we talk about power and power relations and structures. So again, in my opinion, I find that the analysis, like I think it's important to start somewhere, but I find the analysis is often limited to the individual. So we get lots of training about unconscious bias, diversity and sensitivity training, which is often framed as a lack of appreciation for other cultures. However, I personally, and feel free to disagree with me, I rarely see it go beyond that where we start talking about systems and institutions that function to uphold white supremacy and oppression. Uh, and as an educator, I am at least like 10 years ago, I would be very wary of saying white supremacy. Like I'd have to like nudge someone who was white and be like, you say white supremacy and white privilege because I am not even gonna talk about this 10 years ago. But you can see that things have changed. And I think that's more of part of the, the general conversation, especially after COVID and, uh, and the Black Lives Matter movement. So briefly, what exactly is the goal? What, so we see equity, obviously, and what does that mean? And so I think there's also a heavy burden on racialized and indigenous people who do take on leadership, um, like at the top of quote unquote union leadership. Like what is, the, they have to be everything to everyone. Like are, is their job just to be the leadership and push for a, a progressive agenda? Are these people supposed to overhaul the whole union? You know, the overhaul the whole labor movement? Are they reframing the whole labor relations framework? Are they supposed to overthrow capitalism, overthrow white supremacy? There's a big burden. And obviously, you know, we've had uh, Hassan Youssef as the Canadian Labor Congress um, president. Like, what type of uh, responsibilities and what type of expectations were fairly or unfairly placed on him? Same with our current uh, Canadian Labor Congress uh, elected slate. What, what is fair? What is not fair? Uh, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's just a difficult conversation. Okay, thank you. I will stop sharing. Stop share. Great. Okay, fant I mean, fantastic. Uh, thank you, Patricia, for that intervention, because I think that question of what, what are we actually trying to do is really actually quite central to assessing whether or not our political strategies in our organizations are amounting to anything. Um, you know, are we trying to re- reorganize who is on the ladder that which is an inherently kind of hierarchical thing right or are we actually trying to undermine hierarchy per se right which i think many of us are kind of you know we're we're on we're torn between these two imperatives right because on the one hand i think everybody here shares an anti hierarchy perspective but we all also exist within structures that are hierarchical 
and try to figure out how to maneuver and exert power within those hierarchies. And of course, you know, when you try to manage in an institution, you have to learn the rules of that institution in order to quote, be effective. Um, and I think as, as many of us may, may agree, it means internalizing some of the norms or ideas that go with that uh, with with operating within hierarchies in a way that become invisible to you over time, and and that that could that extends to you know all kinds of activists within the labor movement, right? Because that idea that we take sort of the capitalist framework for granted and that unions are sort of a way for working people to negotiate their place within a hierarchical economy is perhaps part of our part of the reason why our politics are so limited is that our ambitions are kind of inherently confined by an acceptance of those hierarchies. So I really appreciate that intervention. And I guess I would, um, I would start to then invite people in the audience to post questions in the Q&A and I would be very happy to, to pose them and motivate the conversation. But I think I wanna, I wanna ask people on the panel to, to this question. Some of what we've talked about um, emphasizes the more personal, psychological and emotional dimensions of doing this work, both for people who are struggling for a place in these organizations, but also the people who um, are perhaps occupying positions of power and who might be wanting to defend their place within those institutions. Um, so that's one dimension. And I, I, I like to think about the, the wages of whiteness as the, this concept that to explain some you know, white folks attachment to uh, a particular place they've been able to achieve or a, a particular um, benefit they've been able to achieve by virtue of their whiteness in the context of a society that otherwise uh, demeans working people. Um, so like to what extent is this struggle a psychological and emotional one? At, and on one hand, does it matter if like, to what extent does it matter? Because as Patricia, I think has said like, we're, we're also talking about structures of power and like personal um, engagement with one's bias is not enough, perhaps, to really do the kind of thing that we need to do to challenge the structures of power. So like, how do we navigate between these two dimensions of like dealing with the, the personal and psychological investments we have in hierarchy versus dealing with the structures that actually force us to respond to them in ways that get us to accept them. I don't know if I hope that's that's sort of a question that makes sense. What what do folks think? <laughs> We've got some questions coming up, but I, I open it to to anyone here who'd like to make sure to unmute yourself. May, yeah, maybe I'll just take a stab at this in responding to what Fred and Patricia have said. And I think it's important, uh, thank you, Fred, for talking about the hopefulness of structural change through the anti-racism organizational action plan. And to me, this is, comes it back to that whatever we do, this is political work. And it's so fragile right now that, you know, if you've seen the larger political picture with Trump and how the right populist right wing can seize that much power, it's using these cracks, using playing on people's fear and anxiety about others in gaining, in gaining their power or maintaining the white supremacist system. So I guess I'm, my concern is particularly with now with the COVID and the COVID quote unquote recovery, I think we have a responsibility to push and say, is the recovery, is the word recovery really appropriate? What would be a new normal for after a post COVID environment where anti-racism, you know, confronting with white supremacies can also be part of that agenda. And, you know, uh, I guess my point is when things are so fragile, it's, it, it's so easy for the right wing to push it and topple it over. 
take a look at employment, our employment equity legislations back in 1994. And when Harris came in, it got repealed. Everything's gone, right? So that's the precarity of this. So the other piece is on, in terms of our goal, uh, what Patricia has posed, to me, I think, you know, part of the reason in linking rate, the issue of race and capitalism is saying, we all, you know, both white, black, indigenous and racialized, so we all need to be liberated from racial capitalism. And unless we can ground our organizing as a political project in confronting capitalism, in confronting imperialist, capitalist, <laughs> uh, patriarchy, then this, this whole project will be, it's, I guess I'm being really impatient right now with my patience. <laughs> and, and we've been told so, for so long that we have to be patient with our impatience that I'm saying, you know, what would be there for in the future for my generate for my my grandchildren, right? And what kind of labor movement will there be? And are you? And then, you know, last but not least, is are we all in this for the same reason? When you when white folks have nothing to lose. Is are we there for the same reason? So. Thanks. Uh, I I don't know if anyone else wants to answer, but we have a few really interesting, good questions in the in the chat. So um, I think I'm going to pose one from uh, Frank Saptel. I hope he doesn't mind me calling him out. Everyone, I think lots of people know Frank uh, in his role uh, at the Canadian Labor International Film Festival, amongst many other things. Um, I think Frank asks a really difficult question, actually, uh, but one that has been on my mind, too, and I think is probably on the mind of lots of people who might be want to be white co-conspirators. Conspirators. So he says, in terms of bringing the non-Indigenous and non-POC folks along, how do we balance the sometimes conflicting notions of, on the one hand, I think speaking from a, a, uh, a racialized person's perspective, it's not my responsibility to educate you, you have to do that yourself, which is totally, we, we all understand the, the, the vibe behind that, versus uh, I have a responsibility to bring up issues as a white person when they happen and then, or, or as, a, as a person of color and then point folks in the right direction. So like how, how do we reconcile these two dimensions of the work, right? Where on the one hand, we, there is a, I would maybe rephrase it like nothing about us without us, on the other hand, we don't want to be responsible for having to educate white folks about the the situation. So how 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 do we manage those two maybe uh, aspects of the struggle that might be in tension with each other within the context of unions, but also more generally? Anybody want to address that question, Carol? I, I think I think what we have to, and I mean that's part of why we we said about bell hooks and Martin Luther King and the whole aspect of, uh, of, of having difference, but, but, you know, for being from a place of love and, and, and the importance of the movement, it's, it's messy. It's messy. And it's, it's like, don't be afraid, just because you're afraid you're going to, if we're going to keep being afraid that we're going to step on something, as I said, I have, you know, work that I do with the sisters that I'm currently working around, labor education, we all step in it at times. We all do. But it's just, they know that it's not up for me to educate them, but it's also we're willing to be called when we do do something in a way that says, do you understand what the analysis you just used? Because let's face it. We all breathe this stuff in all the time, right? We breathe it in all the time with that. We're all complicit in it, which is why I love the way Bell Hooks framed white supremacy. It wasn't just about white folks. She was saying about white supremacy. We breathe that stuff in too. We turn ourselves, over the years, 
I have turned myself inside out trying to think, okay, now this is a really good white person. So how do I think about, how do I say this to them that they're not going to cry, that they're not going to get defensive, that they're going to hear me? I'm done with that. I am now at a place where, you know what? If we we understand what we're what we're up up against and what we're all working for, then we're gonna have we're gonna have pretty tough discussions at a point. So I I, I think that's part of and I must say in some of the work I've done with Fred, that's what I appreciated about Fred. He sat in the room. He's the you know Ontario QP Ontario president. He sat in the room. He knew not to take up too much space, but he was vulnerable. He, you know, he had people, members, uh, staff say things to him. He was willing to have that conversation. I don't see that from a lot of other, I, I, well, you know, I don't see it from any white leaders. That's what we have to do, right? And not be afraid to have these conversations that's where we're at if you know patricia talks about the goal those are the real conversations that certainly i as a black woman want to have because as i said i'm tired of doing this okay how do i do like you know even when patricia talked about not saying white supremacy it was over i think it was over 10 years maybe longer when i first with a, a union i won't name said white supremacy the the white leadership almost had a heart attack. You're calling us all racist. Oh my God! And you can't you use another word? Even in CEP, when I wrote the first anti-racism policy for CEP as the human rights director, and I called it unlearning racism, you would have thought that I called for you know. And and I'm like, you know what? I can call it another name. A pig still a pig. Like I I don't know what you want me to call it. That's what it is. So it's like that. This is what we need to do is have the kind of conversation we're having here. White leaders need to come out of the ivory towers, and especially with the pandemic, they've, they've got real cover with the, being on Zoom and stuff, and start having these conversations and reflecting upon their implicity with keeping this stuff going and what it is they're willing to do to change it. Okay, we've got we've we've provoked a lot of responses, uh, which is no, I mean, for not for just that, but uh, let's, it's there's some great questions. I don't think we're gonna be able to get to them all. Um, Carissa Taylor, uh, who says that she's her neck's been hurting from nodding in agreement with uh, with all of you. So I hope that Chris will be able to have a physio appointment paid by un union benefits for that. Um, in any case, she asks one of the things that she's been trying to talk with about folks is the difference between EDI and decolonization. Um, does anybody want to, because, you know, we have been talking about those two things in a common conversation, but they aren't exactly the same thing. Um, uh, Shelly Ricci also kind of chimes in on this a little bit. Uh, does anybody want to maybe articulate why, what they they how they understand these two things to be distinct, um, even if they might be related in spirit, and uh, why is it important to maintain the distinction? Anyone? Well, maybe I'll just quickly say that I think that. Uh, I don't believe the labor movement has really begun the work of decolonization in, in, in truth at all. Um, I think we are still very much at the place where we have been in relation to some of these other things that we've been talking about, you know, policy papers, uh, that kind of stuff. Voting on resolutions saying, we support the calls to action. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and so that work needs to begin. And I think it has to be different from uh, talking about inclusion because decolonization has to not only imply, it means we configuring the structure that you use. And that is uh, in many ways what we're talking about with white supremacy and with capitalism. This is not easy. It is messy. Uh, and it's, uh, so, uh, you know, I think they are separate uh, and I think the work hasn't 
truly begun in our movement and it is, it's desperately needed. Anyone else want to weigh in on this, um, this question about the distinction between these two modes of struggle, these two goals? I mean, my, my, my piece is EDI is too incremental. It does it, you could have, they can facilitate quote unquote, the difficult conversations, but without getting into the source of the systemic barrier, the foundational problems that have propped up this racist society that has propped up and tolerated white supremacy for all these years, because it ties in so closely with capitalism. To me, I think bell hooks talk about uh, activism, it, the nature of active practice. I would like to see going beyond EDI, the decolonizing practice is an active engagement from our, starting from ourselves in recognizing where our own position, where our own complicity and where our own responsibility and then building that community that can be providing and supporting any initiatives that advance and challenge the power structure. And to me, I think EDI, it's too slow and it's too soft and it's too pale. Okay, great. Um, I mean, obviously this is a this is a deep question that we're not gonna be able to answer today. So, but uh, I appreciate the uh, the initial thoughts on this. Um, a number, oh, just, sorry, go ahead, Carol. Did you wanna weigh in? I, I just, I, just on, on the colonization because I've been, I've been really trying to do a lot of work on this. And, and, and I think Fred's absolutely right. I mean, I think every, there isn't a leader who wouldn't say, yes, we, we're, we wanna decolonize and have no clue what that means. And so in, in the work I've been doing with an indigenous sister, it's, it's, it's a, it's a respect and a returning to a knowledge and a wisdom that has been here from time and memoriam that mm. we totally discounted. We are in a Eurocentric Western framework. That's the framework we work under. So for example, we did a staff conference with a union where we said, this is gonna be a total different conference because we are going to be, this is gonna be a decolonized framework which meant we started with a visual meditation, with a teaching from an indigenous teaching. I mean, can you imagine a union meeting starting and, and that's what we did? I mean, it would be, we would be healthier for it, but we don't do it. So it's really understanding and respecting and learning, not appropriation of voice, but learning from indigenous people of how we can have a healthier, relationship be in relationship with one another and the planet so that means learning that means sitting there and learning and understanding that your structures do not work they do not work they will never work within a circle they will never work within the teachings within the learnings that is in the indigenous community so you know what we've we've done this eurocentric stuff and it's I don't think we're better off for it. So let's let's adopt an indigenous framework for how we how we behave with one another, how we do meetings. I mean, it was it was incredible, right? We we actually took our time, made sure people's voices were heard in a completely different framework. So I think there is a, a difference. Uh, and, and, and it needs to be, and it really needs to be examined and, 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 and us, let's start to really embrace it and, and understand what it means to say, yes, we're, we're in, we want to decolonize. Well, it's interesting that you, you raise this question of like how we talk to each other in the, in the labor movement in terms of like how our conversations are structured. And, you know, Fred made this kind of offhand remark about like the rules of order, but that's another conversation. But in some ways it's not another conversation. It's very much the conversation, right? And there's a number of questions in the Q and A that have to deal with or, or speak to this issue of like the ways we understand how unions should be structured to work effectively or how we understand what union democracy means or 
how we understand the usefulness of bureaucratic forms of organization to like get things done, right? And whether or not any of those practices are compatible with the struggle for uh, racial equity in the deepest sense that we've been talking about um, today. Um, so Jackie, Joanne, and Austin all raise questions around this. So um, Jackie asks, you know, uh, the very structures of the organizations meant to protect workers are incompatible with actual equity and reconciliation for the racial harm caused by capitalism. Do, does anyone have thoughts on what new structure might be more successful in achieving justice and EDI or, you know, whatever, what we would, would envision as something um, deeper than or better than EDI? Uh, Austin asks, can the bureaucratic structural hierarchies of contemporary unions be reconciled with the need for racial equity? Do we have to rethink how unions operate both democratically and administratively to achieve equity? Um, and then Joanne says, the notion of democratic practices is valued in unions, but this notion props up and favors the dominant group. Ha because we believe in majority rule as a democratic principle. Can we find alternatives to traditional democratic practices? So in three minutes, tell me <laughs> uh, what, how we could totally restructure the, the democratic norms and processes that unions uh, adopt. Anyway, a few thoughts. We can run a little over uh, if people have time. Uh, anyone on that? I mean, those are those are, well, those are the things that I really I, I think about a lot. Those are my 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 um, uh, the, those are the, some of the things that keep me up at night, which is weird. Um, what do you think? Like, it, are, is I the notion thoughts, of democracy? I, Go ahead, Carol. Sorry. I have thoughts, but I I don't want to dominate. I, I would like to really hear from from others Patricia. on this, and and especially Patricia. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Patricia. But, okay. Just before that, just before I will say this. I think everything's on the table. That's what we have to do. Like one of the things, like I believe, and I really truly believe this, that we have the experts within the labor movement to get around the table and do this and say, everything's like there's nothing is, is faculty. We're putting it all on the table. Let's get the, the brightest like get you know all these voices around the table and let's examine it all i really believe we have that ability instead of working in our silos and working cross purposes one another and competing for this and all the political nonsense sorry i shouldn't say nonsense but the political dynamics of elections and let's just focus focus on election and keeping my feet dumb and being re-elected and i don't have a clue what's happening on the ground in the membership. I think everything needs to come on the table and I believe that we have the wherewithal to change these structures and really do this work of starting to move this question. And as Patricia said, what's our goal? What's our goal? And that means nothing is, is, is sacrosanct all of it comes on the table. Our constitutions, our rules of order, our democratic processes, our, all of it, all of it. All right, Patricia, did you want to weigh in on this question? I'll briefly say uh, Carol and Winnie talk about seniority in their chapter. Uh, that is a sacred cow, uh, for lack of a better term, in terms of unions and how the seniority has actually worked sometimes to uh, segregate and I purposely use the word ghettoize, uh, racialized and indigenous members. Uh, so there's that. I think we need to, labor unions obviously have their place. They are one of many actors within social, social movements. So I think, uh, of course, let's, let's uh, change it up. Uh, we're not the only ones out there. And I, I think that's important to remember. So there's that. Uh, I think uh, Bill Fletcher has written great art books about uh, what a union that embraces uh, racial equity would look like. And he's way smarter than me, so you can read all his stuff. Uh, and also, I think uh, with the, with uh, re, re 
re-looking and reimagining our, our roles as workers and, and, and our labor and not looking at the grievance and the collective bargaining and the, the union contract is the be all and end all of uh, how we uh, deal with conflict uh, and always making sure that we link our struggles within the workplace within a broader context. Yeah, that's all I'll say. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else on this question of union structures and having to rethink them or how we might? Uh, a subtitle, the rules of order are a tool of white supremacy. <laughs> maybe I'll just put in my two cents. It's maybe we need to rethink how do we define labor movement, mm. right? Maybe we should be working towards a progressive movement of workers, including those who are non-unionizing, including those who have been squeezed out by restructuring, including those who are precariously employed workers that Workers Action Center works so hard in protecting their rights. So our, to me, I think our leadership, the vision of our leadership need to look beyond the union membership card and see all workers as part of this collective movement, right? And, and the way of organizing, how we've been organizing, it's we need to go back to the ground, to the neighborhood on, on the COVID issue, on other vaccination issue, what lead, what unions have been pushing forward. Uh, it should be beyond just the self-interest of my members, hmm. but the broader interest of all workers who are being made vulnerable and being made redundant or whatever. And to me, I think those are, the, the democratic values implies authentic authenticity, but also ethical sensitivity mm. that needs to in, embrace that. And I'm just hoping to God that the, our leadership would have the political will and courage to do the right thing and that not to be afraid of being challenged and not cringe at the word of white supremacy being mentioned. Okay. Uh, I, if anyone else want to, Fred, do you want to weigh in on this? I just quickly say, I just want to acknowledge, I cringed at the word white supremacy. I did it because, not because I don't understand, I didn't academically understand the existence of white supremacy. It's because as an equality activist in our union, what I've experienced is resistance from day one around issues. And so what, what I was most afraid of was the reaction it would generate. Yeah. And what I learned by listening to members in our union was tough toenails or whatever, like th there's gonna be a reaction and that's part of it. And yeah. your reaction is part of it. Uh, the challenge we have in talking about the labor movement is that we're not all the same. Our structures mm -hmm. aren't the same. We have business trade unions who are much more interested in uh, propping up uh, um, structures. And, uh, and anyway, there's a long- I'm standing next to Ford. Sorry, I can say that. <laughs> there could be a long discussion about that. Um, but those of us who care about justice, uh, writ large, I mean, this, what is the goal? The goal is to undo all these things, but that's a big goal. It's kind of like, how do you, I, I, I'm trying to think of another, how do you eat the elephant one bite at a time? Yeah. Maybe that's too um, uh, slow, the, the question of being too slow, right? Yes, yeah. uh, but we, but this is part of it. I, I've been also thinking a lot about our trans members who say, we're always in this binary thing. Is it this or is it that? Is it this or is it that? Maybe it's yeah. a little bit of all of it to try to get mm. to justice. Well, we're, we've gone over time. There's still a few great questions in the chat that I'm not going to be able to pose to you. Um, I, I want to, but I, as we all know, this is an ongoing conversation and I very much appreciate all you, all of you being willing to participate in it, even though it maybe feels like Groundhog Day. Uh, and I hope that um, you all, but also people in the audience felt like it was a, uh, a worthwhile uh, set of discussions to think about how we move this work uh, forward. Um, I mean, I think it's going to be ground day until we win. 
uh, and I guess we're going to just keep trying to win. And there's only well, the only way to think about it is to to do it together and keep having these conversations until it, it starts to really penetrate. Uh, I, I appreciate all of you uh, uh, making the time today. Uh, lots of thanks in the chat for all of you. Um, this has been recorded, so it will be posted on our Facebook page uh, subsequently, and you can share it with all your friends. Uh, and definitely make sure to check out our page and come to future events. Um, we've we've focused our uh, programming this year on questions of racism and anti-racism. Um, so please, I hope we see you in March. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, uh, solidarity to all of us in the coming months we navigate uh, pandemics of all kinds. All right. Thanks, everyone.